Good evening and welcome to Finding Fairness in a Polarized Country, Practicing Civil Discourse. I'm Marie Ann Shovlin and the host for the evening with my colleagues, Ellen Forbes, Judy Pogue, Ellen Smith, Tony Stiber and Carol Watts. Um, we are all members of the League of Women Voters of Santa Clara County and have sponsored civil discourse programs for about six years. We represent the Santa Clara County League of Women Voters Civil Discourse Committee. And we have been, were established to learn, practice, and teach the use of civil discourse principles in communities. Uh, as usual, I have to have a disclaimer here. The League does not support or oppose parties or candidates for office and offers an open and safe space for a multiple of perspectives. As part of getting started, if you could enter your location, although most of us are local, so I don't think we need yes. to really worry about that. Um, and I think we're going to start the event now. Our purpose is to learn how to converse with civility, to listen actively, to really hear another perspective, but not to convince others to our perspective and to practice respect and empathy for others and what we might term others. Our charter is to learn about, as I mentioned earlier, and develop skills in facilitating civil discourse. What is civil discourse? Ellen, you want to speak to that? Um, well, I wanted, we've got a slide here that kind of tells us what it is, but I will ask if any of you have some thoughts. What do you think of as civil discourse when you're going to show up? And um, since there's so few of us, you can just unmute yourself and go ahead and speak if you would like to. When somebody says we're going to have a civil discourse activity, what do you think that involves? Conversation. Conversation, yeah. Okay, as opposed to debate or whatever, mm -hmm. conversation. Right, an exchange of ideas. And an exchange of ideas, okay. Anything else that seems to be, we expand on that? Say again? Listening. Treating each other okay. with respect. Okay, so I heard listening and treating each other with respect. Anything else that anybody would want to add to that? Okay, Being so. open. Being open, okay. So another aspect, perhaps, of listening, but yeah, uh, it puts a different little spin on it. So um, one of the things we like to point out is it's not about being polite, because often when people are polite, they don't say what they think. Um, at mm -hmm. the same time, they sometimes people say too much of what they think. Um, <laughs> so it's about coming together, the ability to talk about the common good, um, and as in this quote that to call American democracy back to its highest values in spite of differences. So the, the Wikipedia definition is here, the engagement in discourse or conversation, trying to expand our understanding, okay? And I like this, that it, it's a, it's a, there is a freedom of speech to it, mm -hmm. that you are free to speak and everyone is um, expected to listen respectfully. So I think we have a good idea of what it is we're trying to do. And we're going to have some conversations tonight. But this is the real purpose of our meeting, is for us to be able to talk in this way. OK, what's, um, then we have our focus tonight is on fairness. And Carol's going to talk about some of the issues of fairness. Carol, you're muted. Um, th this is a chart that has been used in the league for quite a while showing in, uh, and I will admit that I am going to give some of my own personal viewpoint about all this, <laughs> um, showing the difference between quality and equity. In my own mind, we must really see that there's a barrier 
and it's the barrier that in my mind is the most important, um, that barriers may not uh, enable everyone, depending on what their, in this case, what their height is. And therefore we can't just give everybody exactly the same that maybe we have to adjust for, in this case, their height. And uh, let, let's go to the next slide. And this, this to me is a very interesting slide because it really tells what happens if you remove the barriers. And in my mind, equality and or justice is the goal. Sometimes I think equality is sometimes the goal that equity Frankly, I see equity as almost an affirmative action, that any time we choose an equity goal, we should at least also understand that hopefully this is only temporary until we can remove the barriers. So I don't know what my colleagues think about the way that I have talked about this, um, but I, this is it, it's sort of the way that I've been looking at it recently. Does anybody else has anything that they'd like to say about these concepts? Not yet. Okay. I think you. I love the pictures. Mm -hmm. I and I, I like the like the way you make the distinctions um, between what each of the pictures might be showing us. Well, one thing I like about it, this statement of uh, you know, removing the barriers, yeah. removing the barriers, I think helps everybody just think of the cutouts on sidewalks which are intent for people with wheelchairs, but it helps anybody, you know, fathers pushing uh, pushing uh, uh, strollers and bicycle riders and children and so, on, and so on. So removing barriers is good. Okay. I agree with that. Any other comments? Um, this is Nina. I um, have seen the first two pictures. I hadn't seen the justice one. I really appreciated that very mm -hmm. succinct description of equity being um, like affirmative action and it's mm -hmm. temporary until we can remove the barrier and then we'll have justice. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Any other comments? Well, I think another word for justice is fairness. Mm -hmm. And that is uh, one of our topics tonight, one of the main words. So um, I think that's one way to, another way to think about it. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's take a look at another concept. Whoops. These are more definitions. And let's take a look at another concept. Uh, called polarization. I think we're all familiar with that. And this mm -hmm. is just a brief, I have this set up so it wouldn't do this. <laughs> oh, I hope you enabled the right settings so we can hear this. Okay. Try it. So you probably have the sense, as most people do, that oh. polarization- Okay, stop it, Mary Ann. We cannot see yeah. the video. Oh. Okay, you're going to have to stop the screen share and and then when you go back uh, Okay. Now, when you when uh when you go back to screen share and you set to share the screen, be sure you say share sound in the lower left-hand corner. Before you press share, do you see that? Ah, okay. So share sound and optimize. I, I, I don't know whether optimize for video clip matters, but I think you need to, although we heard the sound, what I didn't see was the video. We didn't see any picture, oh. yeah. Let's try this. Well, I guess that's not going to work. There you oh, go. You can see there, it. You. Yeah. there you go. Okay. Well, wait just... a minute here. Uh, this is a different. Uh -oh. uh... That one looks interesting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Can you can you yeah, see that? Yep. Perfect. So you probably have the sense 
as most people do, that polarization is getting worse in our country, that the divide between the left and the right is as bad as it's been in really any of our lifetimes. But you might also reasonably wonder if research backs up your intuition. And in a nutshell, uh, the answer is sadly yes. In study after study, we find that liberals and conservatives have grown further apart. They increasingly wall themselves off in these ideological silos, consuming different news, talking only to like-minded others, and more and more choosing to live in different parts of the country. And I think that most alarming of all of it is seeing this rising animosity on both sides. Liberals and conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, more and more, they just don't like one another. You see it in many different ways. They don't want to befriend one another. They don't want to date one another. If they do, they find out, they find each other less attractive. And they more and more don't want their children to marry someone who supports the other party. Particularly shocking statistic. You know, in my lab, the students that I work with, we're talking about some social, uh, some sort of social pattern. I'm a movie buff, and so you know, I'm often, I'm often like, what kind of movie are we in here with this pattern? What kind of movie are we in with political polarization? Well, it could be a disaster movie. It certainly seems like a disaster. It could be a war movie. Also fits. But what I keep thinking is that we're in a zombie apocalypse movie. Right? You know the kind. Just people wandering around in packs, not thinking for themselves, seized by this mob mentality is trying to spread their disease and destroy society. And you probably think, as I do, that you're the good guy in the zombie apocalypse movie, right? And all this hate and polarization that's being propagated by the other people because we're Brad Pitt, right? Rethinking, righteous, you know, just trying to hold on to what we hold dear, you know, not foot soldiers in the army of the undead. Not that. Never that. But here's the thing. What movie do you suppose they think they're in? Right? Well, they absolutely think that they're the good guys in the zombie apocalypse movie, right? And you better believe that they think that they're Brad Pitt and that we, we are the zombies. And who's to say that they're wrong? I think that the truth is that we're all a part of this. And the good side of that is that we could be a part of the solution. So what are we gonna do? What can we do to chip away at polarization in everyday life? What can we do to connect with and communicate with our political counterparts? Well, these were exactly the questions that I and my colleague, Matt Feinberg, became fascinated with a few years ago. We started doing research on this topic. And one of the first things that we discovered that I think is really helpful for understanding polarization is to understand that the political divide in our country is undergirded by a deeper moral divide. So, one of the most robust findings in the history of political psychology is this pattern identified by John Haidt and Jesse Graham, psychologists, that liberals and conservatives tend to endorse different values to different degrees. So, for example, we find that liberals tend to endorse values like equality and fairness and care and protection from harm more than conservatives do. And conservatives tend to endorse values like loyalty, patriotism, respect for authority, and moral purity more than liberals do. And Matt and I were thinking that maybe this moral divide might be helpful for understanding how it is that liberals and conservatives talk to one another and why they so often seem to talk past one another when they do. So we conducted a study where we recruited liberals uh, to a study where they were supposed to write a persuasive essay that would be compelling to a conservative for in support of same-sex marriage. And what we found was that liberals tended to make arguments in terms of the liberal moral values of equality and fairness. So they said things like, everyone should have the right to love whoever they choose. And they, they being gay Americans, deserve the same equal rights as other Americans. Overall, we found that 
69% of liberals invoked one of the more liberal moral values in constructing their essay. And only 9% invoked one of the more conservative moral values, even though they were supposed to be trying to persuade conservatives. And when we studied conservatives and had them make persuasive arguments in support of making English the official language of the US, a classically conservative political position, we found that they weren't much better at this. 59% of them made arguments in terms of one of the more conservative moral values, and just 8% invoked a liberal moral value, even though they were supposed to be targeting liberals for persuasion. Now, you can see right away why we're in trouble here, right? People's moral values, I mean, they're their most deeply held beliefs. People are willing to fight and die for their values. Why are they going to give that up just to agree with you on something that they don't particularly want to agree with you on anyway? If that persuasive appeal that you're making to your Republican uncle means that he doesn't just have to change his view, he's got to change his underlying values too, that's not going to go very far. So what would work better? Well, we believe it's a technique that we call moral reframing, and we've studied it in a series of experiments. In one of these experiments, we recruited liberals and conservatives to a study where they read one of three essays before having their environmental attitudes surveyed. And the first of these essays was a relatively conventional pro-environmental essay that invoked the liberal values of care and protection from harm. It said things like, in many important ways, we are causing real harm to the places we live in. And it is essential that we take steps now to prevent further destruction from being done to our earth. Another group of participants were assigned to read a really different essay that was designed to tap into the conservative value of moral purity. It was a pro-environmental essay as well, and it said things like, keeping our forests, drinking water, and skies pure is of vital importance. We should regard the pollution of the places we live in to be disgusting. And reducing pollution can help us preserve what is pure and beautiful about the places we live. And then we had a third group of participants that were assigned to read just a non-political essay. It was just a comparison group. We could get a baseline. And what we found when we surveyed people about their environmental attitudes afterwards, we found that liberals didn't really matter what essay they read. They tended to have highly pro-environmental attitudes regardless. Liberals are on board for environmental protection. Conservatives, however, were significantly more supportive of progressive environmental policies and environmental protection if they had read the moral purity essay than if they read one of the other two essays. We even found that conservatives who read the moral purity essay were significantly more likely to say that they believed in global warming and were concerned about global warming, even though this essay didn't even mention global warming. That's just a related environmental issue. But that's how robust this moral reframing effect was. And you know, we've studied this on a whole slew of different political issues. So uh, you know, if you want to move conservatives on issues like same-sex marriage or national health insurance, it helps to tie these liberal political issues to conservative values like patriotism and moral purity. And we studied it the other way, too. If you want to move liberals to the right on conservative policy issues like military spending and making English the official language of the US, it's, you're going to be more persuasive if you tie those conservative policy issues to liberal moral values like equality and fairness. All these studies have the same clear message. If you want to persuade someone on some policy, it's helpful to connect that policy to their underlying moral values. And you know, when you say it like that, it seems really obvious, right? Like, why, why did we come here tonight? Why? <laughs> incredibly intuitive. Uh, and even though it is, it's something we really struggle to do. You know, it turns out that we go that when we go to persuade somebody on a political issue, we talk like we're speaking into a mirror. We don't persuade so much as we rehearse our own reasons for why we believe some sort of political position. You know, we kept saying when we were designing these reframed moral arguments, you know, empathy and respect, empathy and respect. You can tap into that, you can connect, and you might be able to persuade somebody in this country. So thinking again about what movie we're in, maybe I got carried away before. Maybe it's not a zombie apocalypse movie. Maybe instead it's a buddy cop movie. Just roll with it. Just go with it. Please. 
you know the kind. There's a white cop and a black cop, or maybe a messy cop and an organized cop. Whatever it is, they don't get along because of this difference. But in the end, when they have to come together and they cooperate, the solidarity that they feel, it's greater because of that gulf that they had to cross, right? And remember that in these movies, it's usually worst in the second act when our leads are further apart than ever before. And so maybe that's where we are in this country, late in the second act of a buddy cop movie. Born apart, but about to come back together. It sounds good, but if we want it to happen, I think the responsibility is gonna start with us. So this is my call to you. Let's put this country back together. Let's do it, fight the politicians and the media and Facebook and Twitter and congressional redistricting and all of it, all the things that divide us. Let's do it because it's right. And let's do it because this hate and contempt that flows through all of us every day makes us ugly and it corrupts us and it threatens the very fabric of our society. We owe it to one another and our country to reach out and try to connect. We can't afford to hate them any longer and we can't afford to let them hate us either. Empathy and respect empathy and respect. If you think about it, it's the very least that we owe our fellow citizens. Thank you. Well, with that in mind, let's look at how our brains work, which that help, which will help explain why some of these polarization things are, are so detrimental. We make the majority of our decisions based on feeling instead of thinking. And our decisions are influenced by our emotions and many invisible influences. These are quotes from a Dr. Terry Wu, who is a neurophysiologist and has done a lot of research on how our brains work and why they work the way we, they do. Rational consumers do exist. We're all capable of making rational decisions. What makes us human is largely due to the highly developed frontal cortex that we have, this area in here. Our frontal cortex is much larger than that of other mammals. And that part of the brain is the gatekeeper of our emotion-driven behaviors. It can overrule our impulsive decisions. Just, and just because it can, doesn't mean it always does. Very often, even rational decisions have many emotional elements. This is because we don't analyze all the information. We need, we don't have, we don't always have access to the facts needed to make a completely logical decision. Wherever Thank we lack, you. Wherever we lack facts, we often, um, emotion will kick in and nudges us towards certain decisions without our full conscious awareness. And neuroscientists have discovered that up to 95% of decisions are made based on emotional responses instead. There's another even more important factor, and that is belonging. We tend to favor those who are part of the same groups as ourselves. And studies have found that small commonalities that are often overlooked have the power to motivate people to be more collaborative and helpful, being part of the group or the tribe. Now let's look at our conversations and how we're going to talk about some of these topics. Now we do have, and Carol is going to talk a little bit more about this now. Carol? 
Uh, yes, we've just chosen four different topics, and we didn't know how many people were going to come tonight. Uh, so we'll see. We may end up changing some of this. But basically, there are four different groups. We were thinking of talking about, we're going to talk about, we're prepared to talk about affordable housing, and NIMBY versus YIMBY thing. Uh, what are the issues involved? Uh, also, is it fair to have bail requirements, yes or no? Uh, a mental health is a major issue, and especially how it affects the unhoused people. How should we handle this? And universal basic income, as we know, since this was done in Stockton and some other places for a while, should we be giving people money if they don't have enough? And um, what the way we're going to divide this is I'm going to offer you uh, very quickly now a series of break uh, the, the four breakout rooms and ask each of you to choose which breakout room that you would like to go to. And I and they are going to be they're labeled housing, bail, mental health, and universal basic income. Because we're a total of, of, of 14 people right now, I think we will probably end up with only three uh, instead of four rooms. So we'll just see how it goes. I mean, if everybody chooses uh, housing, for example, we'll, we'll have to figure out whether we just have one room or, or what we're going to do. But my guess is we'll, we'll have a couple of rooms. So we will leave it up to the person who's guiding your room to decide whether or not uh, you guys should leave and go to another room. So let's see how it's going to go. Uh, I'm going to uh, start all the rooms. You choose which room you want to have. Getting people to talk to each other and everyone is open to different solutions, but also wants to make sure we had input into how the solutions were put together. That you know, affordable housing would be well designed, that shelters for people who are homeless would be well put together with appropriate staffing, etc. So with all the right caveats, people were very open to the idea of having much more mixed and much more affordable, much denser housing. Okay. Did you um, hear um, wow. Newsom's um, plan today? Uh, 1,200 um, tiny homes around California? 1,200? Mm -hmm. 1,200. <laughs> I mean, like in nothing. four cities. So it's just a, a little drop in the bucket, but it's yeah, a start. It yeah. So w were, were your discussions positive or, or negative? Positive. I thought ours was, was quite positive. Yeah. Uh -huh. I would say positive, but and it was good to have a variety of opinions, though. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah, and I think I was in, that was in the universal income, and I think they weren't so much opposing opinions as no. different perspectives and mm -hmm. concerns and things you need to think about, different ways of looking at the problem. Yeah. Did or you change issues. your mind on any of the ideas you had before you went in, after your conversations? No. I had some different, like I said, some different perspectives, I guess you would call it. Mm -hmm. Wider opinions. <laughs> One of the interesting things I heard, it, oh, go ahead. Linda. Oh, I was just going to say that I think for me, it, um, it helped to crystallize my thinking more, mm -hmm. to actually articulate it and have discussion and, um, you know, sort of Increase my interest in actually learning more too. Which group were you in, Linda? Um, the mental health. Oh yeah. One. Yeah. The most interesting comment that was made was that the group agreed with all the things, both the pros and the cons. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so just quit solutions. calling them. Quit calling them pros and cons. They were just statements of fact. Yes. Or, uh, well, well, yeah. And that's really the point that none of these issues are completely black and white. Uh, there's always uh, the 
the optimal solution is somewhere in the middle, which is a mix of pro and con aspects of an issue. Yeah. Well, thank you. That's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Just when when Tony mentioned all the caveats, um, that was helpful in our group um, on the UBI. There's so many things to consider before you mm -hmm. um, jump into that kind mm -hmm. of a thing. I think the question that's always in the, the elephant in the room is always what happens if you've got somebody who's a real firebrand who participates in these discussions and how do you work with that person because obviously one of the things we're trying to do with civil discourse is figure out how do we bridge the really nasty political divides mm -hmm. and if you can have a polite discussion that really helps but that's not always possible. Well what I've learned from <laughs> um, civil discourse materials is you start with anything basic like mm. do you like broccoli i mean <laughs> anything something you can agree on and go from there <laughs> yeah i love it yeah. <laughs> yeah so how how could we improve this process for future events i just somehow get more people <laughs> How, is it possible to choose a subject that would be divisive among, uh, let's say, League of Women Voters types of people? Well, we thought housing might be. Was it? Well, even with housing, I think people agreed on the basic principles. And you know, we tried to talk about, well, what happens if we built a homeless shelter right next door to you know, our own house or your own house? Mm -hmm. because that, that's where it would really the road meets the road. And the people were generally in agreement, well, you know, if it's put together in the right way um, with appropriate um, caregivers and so on, then, yeah, it's probably all right. Yeah, would others in the group agree with what I just said? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, maybe one thing that maybe could have helped would be to force us to to talk about our issue in terms of the opposite stand. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know quite how did <laughs> I would have been stumped to do that, but mm -hmm. that that's probably where I want to get to. I mm -hmm. actually participate. I'll just briefly participated in a some kind of workshop where that was actually the case. You were assigned which side you would take, and I was told to be anti-abortion. And it was a very interesting thought process. Wow. Well, if it's killing, isn't it? It's murder. And how do you argue with someone who, who feels that way? So it was, it, you know, it didn't change my mind, but it, I being forced to step into that mentality made me see something in a different way. And it was a very comfortable situation where everybody was very, um, you know, the point was to try to, again, discuss things. So, you could even try some of that. You know, what's it mean to try to argue the other side? Mm -hmm. like high debates, school debating. Yeah, like high school debating. You just get the topic yeah, and have you to. go with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was trying to think just now about what Willer said and coming from the um, patriotic, um, I, uh, the, the three things that, that he mm -hmm. seemed to feel that conservatives are moral principles versus I have the sense here that almost everybody comes from the other point of view. So um, how we could set that up to challenge people to come from an opposite point of view. I, I think that would be a, a good exercise is how do you reframe your argument yeah. using the, the, the Rob Wilder talk mm -hmm. um, Re reframe it using the the values that are important mm -hmm. to sort of the opposition or, you know yeah. if in, in right. and, and so that you can and how do you work toward coming toward common ground because one of the what i enjoyed about um our lunch with league speaker today uh professor skinnell from san jose State, is he talked about um the importance of um um deliberative democracy and how to have those kinds of discussions and some in a way some agreements you have to have to have those discussions um and maybe those are some of the things worth talking about how, how can you come to that and 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 can we agree to talk about 
to talk about it from the framework of pure democracy. Just, so you find the common ground first, hope to, hopefully. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I kinda... have to say, it, it was very positive for me to think about that. You, you know, it's, we, we, and, and also not to focus on the negative in a way. He was, he's talked about talking to your friends about not taking democracy for granted and talking about the positives because we hear the negatives so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the negatives are what gets us excited. Yeah. Which is why people oh, will listen to those. Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of like uh, as bad as some people may think our healthcare system is in the United States, I have to say that my personal experience in the last um, 10 months of my husband having a spinal cord injury and going through a process mm. of um, recovery um, in our Valley Medical Center here in San Jose, which I had never set foot on before, which I knew nothing about except we paid tax to support it, was a very positive one. So I want to tell that story, right? Mm -hmm. I want to tell people how lucky I feel I am that I live in the Bay Area, which has good technology, good medical care, um, and resources. Now, if, if this incident had happened somewhere else in rural California, he might not have survived mm -hmm. as well. He might not have recovered so well because inadequate access to that kind of care. So, so mm -hmm. we focus so much on the negative, you know, we <laughs> should talk about when democracy does work. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, I think that, that, you know, just to take a counter one to that is our health system is great if you have insurance and mm -hmm. money mm -hmm. because yes. you can, well, I shouldn't say it's great, but you can probably find what you need, um, especially around here where there's very high quality care. But well, yeah. when you talk about that equity issue and justice, but, but you don't have the same quality of care in other parts of California. Yeah. Right. And which should we care up, about that? Which brings up another topic, universal health care as opposed yeah. to private insurance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we know that our maternal uh, mortality rates are higher than in other OECD countries. So yes. we've got and some it's big higher this year. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Especially among people of color. Right. Yeah. I thought it was interesting that the title of this is called Finding Fairness. So we're already using liberal terminology, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. We didn't point, frame yeah. it in terms of a conservative framing, which, you know, we're so I do I think, think it should... might be really interesting to to force us in a way to think with the mm -hmm. other framework, because I don't I don't like the fact that they've also usurped patriotism. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. Because I, I, you know, we can, we can embrace that as well. So I would love to have maybe some conversation around that um, with some. Mm -hmm. uh, are there, and he did. Yeah, and I, I agree with that because he used equity and fairness for the liberals and not for the conservatives. And they're just as deeply entrenched at, in equity and fairness as um, uh, the, the liberals. And how would you ex express that? How do you mean that? Well, I think if you talk to conservatives uh, about equity and fairness, you would probably come up with the same, <clears throat> the same set of pros and cons as the liberals would. Yeah. Depending, so, but, they the wouldn't, but they yeah. wouldn't use the term equity and they wouldn't use fairness. Um, they, would I, use, they would use fairness. They probably use equality more than equity, um, but they would use equality and they'd use fairness. In, well, they actually, may just, they may use the same terms, but not necessarily put as much emphasis on the terms as liberals do. Mm -hmm. I think that's the point of what Jonathan Haidt mentioned in his book, that you know, generally people agree on these different uh, moral values, but conservatives will put more emphasis on, on this set of values, and the wacko liberals like myself would put more emphasis on those values. Mm -hmm. Ellen has her hand up. Yeah, um, I was calling back the really interesting book by Jonathan Haidt called um, Oh shoot, <laughs> title's escaping me. But, um, the oh, Righteous Mind. The Righteous Mind. But he included something that Willer didn't, which is that there's a very strong feeling about justice among conservatives, that you should get what you deserve and yes. what you earn. Yes. As opposed to, oh, let's give everybody a universal basic income. So that's all this fairness and caring as opposed to 
you have to earn it and you should and if you earned it you should get to keep it yeah so it is a kind of justice or, or, yeah because um, i think i think liberals are just as just as as i think that justice is just as fair to um liberals as they are to conservatives right they, so the words take on a different you know can i yeah. can i have the name of that book again what was your book it's called the righteous mind i put it in the and, chat oh very good oh, Tony. good H A I D T. Yeah. So um, somebody earlier mentioned um, the three uh, focuses for conservatives. It was the patriotism, the purity, and, and sanctity. Uh, no, authority. Authority yeah. is that authority. That, you know, the purity, authority, and justice. Was just it? no it well just, patriotism. It's, it's loyalty patriotism, right? patriotism yeah. which to me falls over into authority in some ways actually it's loyalty and uh, purity or in this book you talk about sanctity i think he's also i think people also talk about purity in the same vein there have been variations of the terms in various presentations mm -hmm. hmm. Well, this uh, discussion afterwards has been, <laughs> been very helpful to me um, yeah, about how we might uh, approach things differently. So I really appreciate it. Yeah, one thing that would be very helpful to the, to the organizing team, would be if you have any uh, brilliant ideas about <laughs> controversial topics among, you know, of, which is what is frankly a very liberal population demographic group that we, that we <laughs> work with, so if you have some ideas of things that might be very controversial, um, or we might have to go back to high school debating subjects type things and see what we can make of those. Well, we started out with a long list of about 10 different topics. And uh, this, we culled that down to the four topics that we had today. Um, and among those original set of topics <laughs> were abortion, <laughs> And there was a lot of hesitancy about approaching that as a topic of discussion. Do you see Debbie's idea? Yes. <laughs> That's good, Debbie. Let me do that because on next door, people will say, I saw a bicyclist almost get hit. And then half the people are like, well, he probably deserved it. He was doing bad things. <laughs> bicyclists are saying, well, the cars need to be more careful. So there's a definite division there. That's Thank fine. you. That's yeah. a good idea. Yeah. And somewhere in the middle is the right, right information. Probably. Yeah, yeah. That not that always the case? Yep, yep. Okay, well, I want to thank all of you so much for your participation this evening and your ideas and your wisdom. Because I know I learn, and I think we all learn a lot from each other, which is one of the reasons we will continue to have these this kind of events.